Hi there, welcome to what Docker and containers will bring to DevOps, uh, sponsored by eSynergy Solutions. I'd just like to check that everyone can hear me, if you could answer with the question box. Perfect. So just a quick overview of eSynergy Solutions, obviously an IT recruitment agency, we're specialising purely in the open source space, um, for instance DevOps, Docker, functional programming, we cover both contract and permanent placements, um, so I just wanted to briefly reach out before the, the, the webinar begins and say if you are looking for any opportunities in London or across the UK, within these skill sets, then please do get in touch with me, my details uh, are at the bottom, um, and I look forward to speaking to you if that's the case, whether it's now or in the future, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, I'd now like to pass over to Jerome, uh, I hope everyone enjoys the webinar and gets out of it what they want. Thank you very much. Hi, so um, let me share my screen. So the, the presentation will last about uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, and then we do Q&A. If you have questions uh, during the presentation, um, please use the, uh, which should show up uh, in the GoToWebinar interface, and then we can sort of and address all the questions by the end. Okay. So, um, short intro, um, this is me, I work for uh, Docker, as you have guessed or will guess from my accent, I'm French, and uh, one of my roles at Docker is to run everything inside of containers and help others to do the same. Uh, so we have successfully, uh, obviously, run uh, server workloads inside of Docker, but we also have been running uh, desktop applications, virtual machines, network appliances, and even Docker itself, which is extremely useful in the development of Docker. So we can do interesting things like running Docker in Docker in a virtual machine, in Docker on a physical machine, which at some point gets extremely complicated because you don't know exactly where the Docker that you're connected to runs on. But anyway, um, this is the agenda for today. So first we will start by presenting some benchmarks about containers to explain why all this matters. So uh, there is this uh, thing that says there are three kinds of flies, lies, damages and statistics. It has been adapted to the um, IT industry with benchmarks because uh, everybody knows that you can uh, tweak benchmarks to make them say whatever you want, but we will present some benchmarks and then um, we will compare containers and virtual machines to explain the results of those benchmarks. Uh, then we will talk a little bit about enter container communication uh, because this is the enabler for the next thing which will be the new deployment model that we are suggesting with containers. And finally we will conclude to uh, give some um, some ideas of what we will be able to achieve with that new deployment model. So first, let's uh, talk a little bit about those benchmarks. Some people did benchmarks about containers, but first, this is an extremely simple one that everybody can do themselves, uh, which is how long does it take to start a container? And their answer is it's extremely fast. Uh, it takes like a couple of tenths of a seconds to start a container, um, which means that by the time it takes to read that slide, you can start maybe a few dozens of containers. Uh, and I did not even try to make a comparison with the two machines because except if you use some really specialized kind of two machines, it's it's hard or even impossible to to start VMs uh, so quickly. And the intrinsic usage uh, in resources, disk and memory of those containers is also very small. If you start a small or a container like that, even though it's not an extremely useful container per se because it just outputs a message, its disk usage will be about 100 kilobytes and its memory usage will be just a couple of megabytes. If you start a virtual machine, even if that virtual machine does nothing, uh, the disk usage will most likely be 
in megabytes and the memory usage uh, will be at least between 10 and 100 megabytes and that's for a VM that does absolutely nothing. Uh, some people did more benchmarks, so I won't spend too much time on that, but basically they did more serious benchmarks than just checking how fast a container uh, would boot, and they compared, so this is um, infinibent performance in an HPC compute cluster, and they saw no difference whatsoever in latency or bandwidth between uh, running directly on physical machines and running within containers. Um, this is a benchmark of KVM virtual machines versus Docker containers. In both scenarios, this time instead of just running a useless hello world, uh, the, those instances are running an Apache web server and we can see that containers uh, start about like twice as fast and use maybe three times less memory. So that, that gives an idea of the, the density ratios that we will be able to achieve with containers. Uh, this is a benchmark about memory speed. The only thing that matters is that um, bare metal and containers, in respectively green and blue, are exactly as fast and VM in red is uh, slower. So the whole point is not really to say, hey, look, uh, containers are much better than VMs. Let's throw away the VMs and put containers instead. No. The point is that we can use containers without uh, losing performance. That's, that's the key thing because some people uh, will say, well, wait, uh, I already have some of a head with my VMs. If I add containers on top of that, um, my performance will uh, go down and I uh, will have to pay more for the same outcome. No, the thing is that since containers have no or almost no overhead, it's perfectly okay to stack containers on top of an existing VM architecture. So how is this possible? Because as I said, one of the nice things uh, with benchmarks is that you can tweak them any way you want to make sure that they tell exactly what you want and that they show the result you want to achieve. So how uh, did those people um, achieve those results? Um, the answer is that if we look at containers, how they work, and we compare with the two machines, then it will become perfectly clear. Uh, let's look at how virtual machines work. Virtual machines uh, emulate CPU instructions, which is extremely slow. And I'm talking here about like the first virtual machines that came out maybe 10 or 20 years ago. So things like QEMU today. Um, they would emulate everything, which is uh, extremely slow and tedious and has a lot of overhead. So CPU hardware, so each time the virtual machine would have to uh, go over the network or read or write something from the disk, it would talk to uh, some virtual network interface card uh, which would emulate like a, a NE2000 or some other um, well-known spread network interface card which was chosen not because it was a good fit for virtualization but just because it was the, the, the most widespread one when uh, those VM technologies came around and so emulating that specific card means well it, it's widespread so every, every OS out there there has a driver for it and so our VM system will be able to run any kind of operating system. So that's, that's nice for adoption, not so nice for performance. Um, newer virtual machines do much better. Uh, instructions run straight on the CPU which means that for compute workloads there is no overhead and they make use of para-virtualized storage and network which means that instead of trying to pen-free emulate some uh, antique outdated network interface card and IDE controller, they will use something which is well suited for virtualization. Um, the, when, I, when I need to send a network packet from a virtual machine, uh, it will um, directly go to a special buffer space that will be uh, handed off to the hypervisor. So I won't go through many hoops just to pretend that I have um, a fake interface card. Um, I will still go through hoops, but they will be um, designed and optimized for virtualization. Now if we compare to containers, uh, containers are just normal processes 
uh, isolated from each other. So they are completely normal tasks running on the system, except that they have some tags or labels on top of them saying, hey, that, that process um, actually belongs to container XYZ. But that's pretty much it. There is no extra layer. There is no extra overhead involved. And the only thing is that when that process is trying to do something to the outside world, uh, like sending some network traffic or just sending a signal for process or reading from the file system, there is no extra code path or very little. It's a little bit like the UID checking that happens, for instance, when you try to open a file, there is something that checks, oh, are you root or supervisor? Then in that case, I will give you unconditional access to that file. Otherwise, I will check exactly what is your UID, do you have read permission on that file, and, and then I will give you access. This is a very low overhead, and that's the kind of overhead that we are talking about with containers. And obviously, uh, nobody uh, did benchmarks about is it faster to run Hadoop Big Data Map Reduce uh, as root user instead as a non privileged user because that wouldn't really make sense. So the same way, when people are benchmarking containers, they are not directly benchmarking um, the container technology themselves, but the extra things that we add to this technology because containers by themselves have 100% of native performance. So if we have this kind of uh, a little table to make a recap, you can see that in both cases, uh, v VMs and containers uh, use native CPU, so that's great, but VMs will use power virtualized devices while containers will do native system calls, so just like on a normal machine. And in the case of virtual machines, we still have an hypervisor that will arbitrate different resources and basically each time the VM has to uh, to, to get out to the outside world, it has to go through this hypervisor, while in the case of containers, we just use the native kernel directly. So that, that's why those benchmarks show no difference between uh, containers and physical machines. So what does it mean for communication between those instances? How do we communicate between VMs? How do we communicate between containers? So communication between your two machines um, has to use uh, traditional network protocols because the hypervisor is enforcing an extremely strong isolation between VMs. That's the whole point. You can't have one virtual machine just messing around with the memory or the files or disks or whatever of another virtual machine. That's that's one of the uh, of the points of virtualization. It's to have a strong enough isolation so that if you are Amazon, you can run uh, two different machines belonging to two different customers on the same hardware uh, with a fairly good confidence that they won't be able to uh, snoop at each other. Um, so huge advantage from a security point of view, but not so much from a communication point of view because it means that communication has to go through and the network layer, which has some overhead. Containers, on the other hand, are different um, because so the containers are technically using something called namespaces. Uh, namespaces are uh, the, the mechanism that allows each container to have its own process space, its own network space, its own uh, file system space, and those things can be um, enabled or disabled in isolation. It's not all or nothing. It's not this process is running in this container or not at all. You can have multiple containers that share the same network stack. They will be isolated in the sense that um, the process from container A will not be able to um, do anything to a process in container B, it won't be able to kill it, it won't be able to see it, it won't be able to steal its resources, but they will be sharing the same network stack, they will have the same IP address, the same local host interface. Um, this means that we can use normal Unix communication mechanisms, so the mechanisms that we have been using um, for almost 50 years now, since the 70s, so Unix sockets, shared memory, IPC, so we can reuse all, all those techniques instead of having to use something specific to VMs. So how does those inter-container communication mechanisms look like exactly? 
So I, I just mentioned uh, sharing the network namespace, so that shared local host. Um, it means that uh, two containers will have the same network stack, the same IP address, the same network interfaces, uh, the same routes, the same um, IP table filtering rules, and so the most important thing is the same local host. It means that um, one container could be a database listening on local host, the other container could be a web server that needs to connect to that database, and it will connect to localhost and that will work, but they will still be entirely separated uh, for all other purposes. They will be using different file systems, different memory, um, different process spaces, different everything. This is one of the, the, the fastest way for uh, an application to, uh, to connect to its database, um, but we can do even better. We can share a file system, not the entire file system, but just say a directory, and in that directory that will be shared between containers, we can put objects like name pipes, unique sockets, memory mapped files, and um, the the sharing that we will do between those containers will not be um, the kind of sharing that you are used to with virtual machines. Even if functionally it's kind of the same thing, it's okay, I have a directory in that container, I have a directory in that other container, and those directories are the same, um, but technically it's not using some kind of guest FS or shared file system or copy mechanism. Technically, it will be exactly the same directory under the hood. When the container number one is accessing those files, it's accessing directly the file system. When container number two accesses this shared directory, it goes through exactly the same path. It's exactly the same files accessing exactly the same way with zero overhead. It's technically using something called a bind mount. If you don't know bind mounts, you can think of them a little bit like symbolic links, but to a, uh, at a higher level. And then that's currently the, the fastest communication possible between an application and its database. When, when you connect over a local Unix socket, um, I mean, except for some extremely custom databases allowing you to do shared memory or something like that, which anyway is possible as well with that mechanism. Um, that, that's the fastest way. There is, you, you bypass the whole TCP IP layer, you bypass um, all, all the kind of things you typically have when you connect to some database which is not local. So you have local speed even though um, those two components remain separated and that's one of the key things um, that we want to push forward with containers. Let's uh, look quickly at the other mechanisms. So shared IPC, that's system 5 IPC. If you know what this is about, you will be happy to know that containers can share IPC. If you don't know system 5 IPC, just pretend that you never saw that slide because it's confusing otherwise. Um, now this is when containers need to talk to each other on the same machine, but what when they want to talk to the outside world? What if my container needs to connect to something outside of my container host, or what if um, my container needs to accept connections from the outside world. Then we have a couple of things as well. We have the host networking model, where basically our container, instead of sharing the network stack of another container, will share the network stack of the host. I will stop my container, and it will be able to see and use the IP addresses and interfaces of the host. So if I have some uh, special purpose like InfiniBand or some other kind of special interconnect on my machine and I wonder can I use that with containers, then the answer is yes because I will be able to start my container using the same network namespace, the same network stack and I will be able to use those. It means that my container will be able to talk to the outside world with absolutely zero overhead, um, no, no overhead, no performance penalty linked to Linux bridges, IP table, uh, NAT, so that's, that's great. Another thing is what about data, what about disks, what if I want to uh, read or write data from uh, a local pool of disks or some SAN or NAS from my container, um, then um, good news. I can just mount that 
uh, thing on my container host and then I can share that directory between the host and the container and once again I have zero overhead native speed uh, to access this. So where does this uh, lead us? What's this new deployment model that I was talking about and uh, how is this related? Well, um, the goal that we want to achieve is to separate ops functions, so things like backups, logging, remote access, auditing, compliance, security. We want to put that in separate containers so that our application containers can run unchanged in our different environments. If I have a Tomcat application server and I'm, in, and I'm running that in a container on my development laptop, I want to be able to keep exactly the same container as I move it from my development laptop to my testing um, server in the closet to our uh, QA thing on some cloud to our production platform on another cloud, for instance. I want to keep the same container. Why? Because if I change anything in my container, I can say, okay, I'm in development mode, so um, I, I'm sending my logs just to some local file, but when I go to production, it's different. I have to send my logs to uh, my um, log stash cluster, or I have to send them to FluentD or Splunk or Logly or whatever. Then that little change um, could mean something for my application. Maybe the logging system will behave slightly differently. Uh, because locally my logging system will always be available, but maybe when I put in production, you know, if there is like a transient DNS problem that will prevent my application from starting uh, because it can't resolve the address of the log server or whatever, we don't want that. We want to be able to run exactly the same thing, which means that all the differences between the, the environments have to be uh, dealt in separate containers. That's what we want to achieve. If, I, if I'm in dev, I just have my Tomcat container. If I'm in production, I have the same Tomcat container, but I piggyback an extra logging container right next to it. And I can do that just because of those high-speed communication mechanisms between container. So uh, let's look at what the virtual machine deployment model looks like. Um, I have my Linux-based system. I have some libraries. I deploy my application and then I add all those extra operational tasks, logging, backups, metrics, security. Uh, if I use, so this is using the Puppet syntax, but you can have exactly the, the same uh, concept with Chef, Ansible, Salt, or whatever configuration management system you want to use. I will have something like that. We have, okay, um, each web server will include those different templates. The problem is that you could have conflicts between two components. If my logging component requires some given version of Java, but the metrics uh, component is also based on Java, but uh, is using a different version, I have to install side by side my servers two different versions of Java, and it's not impossible. It's, it's just painful. It takes time and we have better things to do than fighting with class path and Java install path and um, so that, that's one problem. Another one is when you have software certified for a given distro. For instance, let's say you're using some security auditing or compliance tool that is only certified for one given version of Linux and happens that you really, really want to run a different version of Linux um, because well, um, enterprise Linux distributions like RHEL uh, are robust and stable, but they, they are not exactly bleeding edge. And so if you uh, want some latest and shiniest version of some package, it will be pretty painful to install that on that older um, Linux version. So, and, and, and the last example um, where you can run into, uh, let's say, challenges to, to look at the price of things, if, if you want to move your, your logging system from one thing to another, uh, then you have to do a complicated transition. Uh, so the solution that we propose is to use um, this separation with containers. So instead of installing all those things um, right next to each other in the VM, we install them in containers. So we still have the Linux-based system. That doesn't change. But now we put Docker 
we put the application in a container and everything else, so logging, backups, metrics, security, all those things will also be in containers, but in separate containers, which means that now, if I want to have my logging system using one version of Java and my graphing system using another version of Java, it's just fine because they are in different containers that can be using completely different versions of Linux. And so let's see a few examples uh, to see how exactly we do that with Docker. So example with the logging system. The, the traditional way uh, to like check my logs is to SSH into my container VM or server to go to the directory with the logs and then use like the good old sysadmin tools, pay, grep, and so on and so on. The new style is, okay, let's create what we call a data container, which is a container that won't run anything. It will just be there, um, to, it will exist for the sole purpose of holding our logs and, and to hold them in a directory that will be shared across multiple containers. And so that directory will be shared with my application container, and my application container will write logs into that directory and then when I want to inspect those logs, then I can start a new container that will also share the same directory. And so from that other container, I will be able to see my logs and use the same tools as usual, um, but without touching my application container. This is great if I want to use some really custom tools. Um, one example, if uh, using some Perl tools to parse your logs and extract some useful information. And if you happen to uh, run some web server with mod Perl, you might run into trouble because mod Perl might be using one given version of Perl. And when you will log into the server and say, oh, I want to use my custom uh, grep, which is also based on Perl, but a different version of Perl. So I will upgrade Perl and I will break my web server. Um, that actually happens. So with the, with the container separation, that's not a problem anymore because if you want to install your custom version of Perl, you can do that in a separate container and still be able to see your logs. You can even do better if you want to send your logs to something else, um, to some logging cluster somewhere. If you want to, to send your log to syslog or whatever, uh, then you can start an extra container um, whose role will be to get those logs from that shared directory and send them uh, to whatever you want. And so the key point is that, um, remember, there is no overhead to access the shared directory. So when you run something that gets those logs and sends them to Logstash, it's exactly and in, in terms of speed and CPU usage and I/O and everything, it's exactly as if this program were running um, directly inside of the application container, except that it's running outside, but it's the same performance, same resource usage. This means that you can change your logging system without touching your application container. You don't have to reconfigure it, you don't have to rebuild it, you don't even have to we start it. And migrations from one logging system uh, to another are easy because you just have to start the new container to uh, scrap those logs and send them elsewhere. And once you're satisfied with uh, the, the flow of your logs, you can stop the old one. Let's look at another example, backups. So the, the old way to do backups would say, okay, let's install all the tools we need on the, say, database server. So I want to use AirSync. Um, maybe I want to send my backups to S3 or something like that, so installing S3 CMD or Bodo. Um, I, I have to make sure I have all the, the tools to dump, uh, to make SQL dumps. Uh, I also need to write a backup script. And then when I want to do a one-shot backup, I connect into the database um, with SSH and I run the backup script. And if I want to do regular backups, I add something in my cron tab. The new way is well, let's create one of those data containers again, this time to hold the files that we need to back up. And then when we start the uh, database server, we will um, set things up so that we use um, that shared location to put the important precious database files. And then when we want to save those files, 
will do that from a separate container and that separate container will be the one with all the backup tools. So if I want to do a one-shot backup, I just start this special container. It has access to my files, so it can um, back them up. And if I want to do regular backups, that's where things get even more interesting. Uh, one simple solution is to say, okay, the old way was set up a cron tab entry um, to run the backup job every day at Uh, uh, the cron then in, a, in a separate container with all my backup tools and I will start that container and keep it running and every day at 5 in the morning um, the cron service inside that container will wake up and perform the backup job. Another option is to say well I don't want to have that container lying around like all the time if it only uh, do some if it only does some work at 5 in the morning so I will put the cron tab entry on the docker host so the container will not be running all the time. It will be automatically started by the host every day at 5 in the morning. An even more interesting method is to say, well, I, I really want to put everything in containers. I don't want to have anything special in my host. So what I will do is that I will have uh, my cron service running in a container, and it will be an extremely small and simple container dealing just with that. And I will give Docker API access to my container so that every day at 5 in the morning, my container will not directly uh, do, run the backup job. It will start the container to do that. So I have a container that knows how to perform backup, and then I have a container that knows how to schedule things at 5 in the morning, basically. And the latter will spin up um, the former. This is particularly interesting because if at some point you move to a, a cluster-wide scheduling system like Kronos, which is based on Mesos, then you will have something like a distributed cron. So you have a centralized uh, cron mechanism that at, at 5 in the morning uh, will fire up a bunch of jobs and it will be able to figure out the resource load on your cluster and pick up the machines that have available resources at that time. It also means that when you do that transition, instead of rewriting all your backup containers because everything has changed, say, well, I have a container that knows how to do backups, um, and so I can reuse that container when I move from cron to chronos or to something else. So that's, again, a, a nice example of separation of concerns, separation of operational concerns, and uh, putting each separate task in a separate container. Another example, network debugging. Um, if we, w when we have some uh, misbehaving web server or load balancer or any kind of application that sends or receives network traffic, someone we have to uh, do traffic sniffing. So it's a, a live packet capture and inspection to see exactly what's going in and out. And so the traditional way to do that is to SSH into the container, VM, or server and use a tool like TCP dump or ngrep and, 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 and see the, the traffic flowing. The new method that we propose is, okay, instead of installing TCP dump and ngrep directly on your container, um, make a separate container image with those tools and run that container image but sharing the network namespace. Remember the shared local host that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, that's it. So now, when I start this container and I do TCP dump, um, I will see the traffic of the other container, the one running at the application server that we want to debug. This is also convenient if you want to run some really custom uh, traffic analysis tool that has a lot of dependencies. Well, instead of installing um, all those dependencies and kind of uh, corrupting your application server, you can put that in a separate container and have everything remaining clean. What if you want to like tweak some configuration at runtime uh, because like the, the official way is, oh, you should just make a new container with a new config and, and restart it, but that's not always convenient. So what if you want to do live changes to configuration? Um, the, the traditional method is well, you just search into container, VM, or server, you edit your configuration, restart the service, that's it. 
the method that that we propose is to um, put the configuration either in a data container as we did before for logs and backups or in a directory that will be shared with the host and then when you want to edit that uh, configuration you can do that either from a separate container or directly from the host so you do your changes to the configuration and then you restart the service um, a nice added bonus is that when you will want to restart the service you can do that in a kind of uh, a more standard way, in the sense that, of course, if you are a, um, a skilled Tomcat developer or administrator, or you totally know how to restart Tomcat, um, but do you know how to restart MySQL, Postgres, Nginx? Um, do you know how to restart this super custom world service that this other team wrote? One of the um, nice things with containers is that uh, they give us a kind of uh, standard primitive to stop and start and restart things. You don't have to know exactly, oh, should I send the signals, should I use etc, init something restart, should I use service CTL, um, should I use system CTL, should I use, no, you can just stop the container, start it, and that works. Let's look at another very interesting example, metrics. Um, traditionally, if you want to collect metrics about a system, you have to install something to actually collect the metrics on the system and then send um, those metrics to a, a central place so you have a nice dashboard with all your system. So the new approach with containers is that you can install a container called C Advisor um, on each node and then um, that thing will still uh, need a central place to collect metrics. But the interesting thing is that we can collect metrics about containers from another container without installing any agent or anything special on the machine. That's pretty different in the sense that in almost all systems before, when you want to have some visibility, uh, you have to be kind of above things. Uh, with containers, there are ways so that a container can inspect its sibling containers. So the next slide will be a, a little bit hairy. So that's the, the command line that you have to uh, to type, or rather to copy paste to start the advisor. So obviously it's a long and complicated command line, and I don't expect anybody to just remember it and say, okay, oh, yeah, sure, that's that's how you start things. But the key thing is that basically this is just starting the C advisor container and all these parameters, the dash dash volumes and uh, um, this is giving that container the visibility that it needs to be able to collect metrics on the system. And so that's pretty powerful because basically that means that when you copy paste that big command line here, uh, then um, there will be a monitoring agent running on your Docker machine and you can connect to that thing with a nice little web interface and see graphs about your containers, but it also exposes those metrics over an API so that they can be consumed by other systems, and it can also store those metrics locally so that you have some history. And this doesn't install anything on the Docker machine itself. Everything will be in the container. C Advisor is a, a project made by the, the Google folks working on Docker and containers. And it's, um, it's um, a really awesome way to get metrics on containers. Um, security. Uh, let's see um, how separating things work uh, works with security. The traditional approach to security, um, and I'm uh, talking about like auditing and intrusion detection here, is that okay? I SSH into my service, and I can run things like CHK rootkit, which is something that tries to uh, find. Uh, tracks uh, and clues of intrusion. I can run something like Tripwire to uh, check that um, my files were not tampered with. I can also run systems like uh, Nessus and Senta, which um, are um, systems that you run from outside of your service and that will basically scan your service and try to figure out if there is something vulnerable here. And of course, you um, basically run those audits on a regular basis, so some of them from inside the service, some of them from outside. Now, um, 
What does it look like with containers? Well, there are two sides of the story. First, uh, we can analyze images at rest. If we prevent package installation in containers, so if we make those uh, containers read-only, uh, then um, if we want to know about vulnerabilities, security problems in our containers, we can just look at those images at rest. I know that my container is running image XYZ, so if I want to check the versions of the packages, I don't have to connect to that container. I can just take image XYZ uh, and look at it separately from the container because I know that the container is running exactly the same thing and that there is like a kind of a, a lockdown mechanism to prevent the container to, from running anything else. This leads to interesting things where, for instance, you could have um, a, a fleet of uh, Docker machines that would be set up to, to run only some given container images and those container images would be on a separate server somewhere where your security company could look at them, I mean where your security department internal or external could look at them and be able to say well this um, specific image has um, a vulnerable version of uh, OpenSSL uh, and then you can say, okay, um, this image is running on this and this and this server, so we need to take action on, on those servers. Now, what about the running containers? Um, and that's another thing which is pretty interesting is that, once again, since um, the, the containers that are running um, are exactly the same than the ones we have on our uh, image server, if we want to do some analysis on those containers, we can start local copies of those containers and we can do whatever we want to them uh, to figure out if they are vulnerable or if there is anything wrong with them. Um, so where does this lead us? Once we have all those uh, things, once we can separate different functions in different containers, um, well, we can achieve a couple of things. Um, so the, the first one is to have practical mutable infrastructure. Immutable infrastructure is this idea that each time that you change a single line of code, even if it's a trivial change like changing uh, some CSS to move a little bit some logo or change the color of a title, and each time you do that, you bake new images, new VM images or new container images in that case, you start new instances, new VMs or new containers, then you send traffic to those new instances and then you tear down um, the old servers. So basically, you never ever make changes to your, to your servers. Each time you want to change something, you create a bunch of new servers, which sounds extremely um, complicated and overkill for small changes, especially when you think about the fact that, okay, I'm creating a bunch of new VM images, I'm starting 100 of new VMs because, yeah, I have a lot of traffic, so I have 100 of web frontends. Just to change one line of CSS, that, that seems wrong. Um, it's not necessarily wrong in the way that this enforces some extremely healthy uh, practices from, uh, from a, a deployment and operation point of view uh, because you, you don't have um, divergences between your servers. There is not the problem of, yeah, we, we manually tweaked some configuration of some servers and now like 10% of the traffic is handled by servers that are slightly different and random things happen and we don't know why. No, with, with immutable infrastructure, you can be 100% sure that the same things run across the board. But it's extremely heavy to do that. Companies like Netflix have been doing that, um, and, but uh, not everybody is Netflix. and not everybody can afford to bake new VM images each time you change line of code. But with containers, um, that's pretty different because container images are extremely easy, fast, and lightweight to build. So even if you're not Netflix, basically, you can have the advantages of immutable infrastructure without having to roll out the heavy artillery to, to build your images. Um, another example of uh, the usefulness of immutable infrastructure if uh, you do, uh, you, you roll out a new version and something goes wrong uh, and maybe you don't even notice immediately like in, and maybe a few hours or days later you say, okay, 
um, there is a serious problem with that new version, we need to roll back. Then no problem, you still have the old version around. If, if you had done manual changes, you would have to log in again and revert those changes manually, uh, which is not always easy even with configuration management. If you're using mutable infrastructure, fine, you just take the images that you had before, they are still around, and you start new servers from them and you send the traffic that way and that's it. So that's one of the advantages of containers, it's helping with immutable infrastructure to make it uh, a reality or at least a possibility uh, for a, a normal size organization, I would say. Another um, nice use case for containers is microservice architectures. So the idea of microservice architectures is that instead of having one big application, um, you, you break that down into many little services. Uh, if you are an online uh, retailer, instead of just having that big website, you say, okay, we have the website, but the website is actually talking uh, to an API that knows everything about the products and how they relate to each other, and so that will be able to show me the products. Then you have a recommendation engine, which will be a separate application, then I will have a search engine, which will be a separate application, then I have billing, uh, shipping, and so on and so forth. All those things are little services. Um, and that's great because um, it means that if one team wants to roll out the new version of the um, search engine instead of the recommendation engine, instead of waiting for the big weekly or monthly deployment cycle, they can deploy on their end without having to synchronize with other teams. Uh, so that leads to faster cycles, more agility, and that's great for the overall quality of, of the team. Um, it also helps to have uh, many little teams rather than one big team, and um, th there is some research that shows that uh, the, the bigger the team, the bigger the communication overhead, so it's basically better to have uh, small teams, each working on small components rather than one big army working on that huge project. And containers can help here, uh, because when you have uh, 10 services to deploy instead of one monolithic application. Uh, it's great because deployment of each individual uh, bit is probably easier, but it still means that your deployment process uh, has to be extremely streamlined and easy, and that's exactly what containers help to achieve. Containers help us to have this nice deployment mechanism, which means that now it's even if we have to deploy 100 times a day because we have 10 services and each service is deployed 10 times a day, that's 100 deployments a day, thanks to containers that would be extremely easy. All right, so uh, that's what I have for today. Uh, thanks a lot. I will now look at the questions and don't hesitate to add some more, more questions using the, the Q&A box in GoToWebinar. Uh, this is some contact information as well. Uh, okay, so just one moment, uh, right. Um, okay, so questions. Um, which way would the networking in Docker be steered as there are quite a few alternatives like PyProc with Flannel? Uh, will something migrate to Docker itself? Will plugin emerge? How, how is this going? Okay, so uh, there is currently um, a bunch of proposals around uh, networking, well, to make networking in Docker uh, better. Um, this, this effort is driven by uh, a number of people in the community, um, including, for instance, SocketPlane, which is a, a company which has been recently formed to address those, those things. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you on the top of my head like the, the exact number of the pull requests where those things are being discussed, uh, but there is a huge discussion and the, the debate revolves around a few ideas, one of them being uh, let's just replace the Linux bridge used in Docker um, with OpenVSwitch uh, because OpenVSwitch doesn't have the same performance problems as the Linux bridge has and um, it's also much more flexible, uh, so that's one of the ideas. Uh, another idea is to uh, just have an even more uh, pluggable mechanism so that you can put up on vSwitch, but you can also put something else if you want. Uh, so those things are being uh, discussed right now. Uh, so Docker itself uh, will evolve to, as I said, uh, either have like native OpenVSwitch and then if you don't like that you can uh, still 
um, hack around it as we do today, uh, or to have an even more predictable um, uh, mechanism. Uh, the next question is, will volume container persisting, um, so um, be, become a part of Docker at some stage? Will it be possible to uh, commit the state of a volume container to the registry? Uh, maybe. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the ability to use the copy and write engine um, for volumes instead of mapping them straight to the underlying host file system. And if we do that, then yeah, totally, we will be able to um, snapshot the volume and to upload it to the registry. It would not be extremely complicated. It's just like, uh, well, uh, as we say, contributions welcome. But that's that's something that we would be very very open to. How do you cope with container restarts of writing the logs in the logs in the volume containers? Uh, right. So. Basically, the, the container has to be, I would say, uh, well behaved, not uh, clobber the logs uh, when when it restarts. Um, so uh, it's generally just a configuration thing. Um, most systems will just happen to the logs, and everything will be fine. If you have something that really insists on truncating the logs, uh, then um, uh, an alternate solution is to say, okay, my log volume will be slash bar slash log, and I will set up my application to send the log to slash bar slash log slash my app, and this my app directory will actually be a sim link, and so when I start my application, instead of starting right away, first I will create um, a unique directory, maybe using some timestamps, so like slash bar slash log slash my app 2014, 11 date of the day, something, something, and then I will do a sim link to that and I will um, just start my application. And so each time I start my application, the logs will end up in a different directory. That would be one of the ways to do that. The next question is, uh, so, all right, so what, what happens with the logs if we have multiple containers running at the same time uh, trying to uh, right to the same location. Well, that, that would be kind of the same thing. Um, it would be just, okay, well, make sure that they don't all write to the exactly the same location, even if it's just by the mean of like subdirectories. Next question. So, Tayan slash truths, which is an image in the registry, is an excellent base for volume containers at, um, right, yeah. Um, uh, it's true. My example was using Docker run BusyBox. Uh, but there is an even better one, uh, Tayan slash truth of that. Uh, speaking of which, there is something called Sleeping Beauty, uh, which is a container image that you can use if you want to run something that just sticks around. Like you want the process to continue to run, um, then you can use that instead of Tayan and truth. Sleeping Beauty. Uh, next question is, can the exec option be used to change configuration at runtime? So can you do like docker exec to get into the container and change the configuration? Yes, you can. Uh, should you? That's that's the real question because yeah, of course you totally can. Um, but and and by the way, if you have not set up the configuration to be on a volume, uh, then it's probably the only option you have because that my example was assuming that you. Um, that you had thought in advance about putting the configuration uh, in a volume. If you haven't, then Docker exec might be your only option. Next question is, can you prevent Docker exec dash it? Oh, can we prevent from using Docker exec? No. Uh, basically, uh, containers will not protect from the host. The host will always be able to do anything it wants to the container. Next question, what recommendation do you have for managing deployment of containers to medium-large clusters of Docker hosts? How do I go about dynamic routing load balancing of web apps deployed to the cluster if I can be sure of which host they're running on? So, um, medium-large clusters could mean multiple things, so I will assume like a few dozens to a few hundreds of hosts. That's exactly the sweet spot uh, where, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, solutions today, but a lot of work is happening. Um, you so uh, it's a shame that I don't have the link right now. But you can look online for 
um, Andrea Luzardi, Michael Crosby, and Victor Vieux, which are three of the Docker core committers, that during the Docker Global Hack Day recently, they made a demo of a, a new orchestration mechanism um, which is targeted exactly at that audience. It's not like huge scale like Mesos and Kubernetes. It's not tiny scale like Fig. It's something in between, and uh, it's, it's something to look at. Uh, so there is a video of that that you can uh, find on, on YouTube and that explains how that works. And about dynamic routing and load balancing, the idea is that you need some kind of cooperation between uh, your orchestration mechanism and your load balancer so that the orchestration mechanism, uh, after starting the container, will say, okay, I have started the containers on such and such and such machines, so I will now uh, talk to the load balancer one way or another so that the load balancer knows where the stuff is running now. Next question is, what is the best way to manage load balancing of Docker instances? Right, so um, there is no best way, but there are a few interesting things. Um, I will just quote one, um, Vulcan-D, so uh, V-U-L-C-A-N-D, which is a load balancer uh, written by Mailgun. Uh, Mailgun is using Docker extensively, and I, I would not say that they have written uh, Vulcan-D just to load balance containers workloads. Uh, but it's pretty close, and um, it's not the only one. But if I were to quote like only one, I say look at this one and, uh, and also do your research because obviously there are others out there depending that might be more suited uh, depending on your use case. Next question: Are there specific workloads that would not recommend running the container? Uh, yes and no. I mean, we we can totally run absolutely everything in containers. Should we? It depends. Um, Sometimes running things in container will be painful because the thing will be using some nonsense graphical installer and getting that running in a container will be a pain. Um, and some stuff doesn't necessarily give you a lot of advantage in containers like uh, huge Oracle servers um, are often kind of designed to run straight on top of the machine on top of the kernel. So uh, putting that in the container doesn't really gain you anything. Uh, but it's, it's not impossible neither. Otherwise, I would pretty much run anything in containers. How do you handle security updates with containers? Uh, the idea is to, um, when there is a security update, you rebuild your images and you deploy those new images. So you, you, you treat that as a code change. When you do a code change, well, you rebuild the container, deploy the new image, and the data follows along thanks to volumes. What is your ETA for Docker for Windows? Uh, I don't know. That's a question for Microsoft. <laughs> I'm sorry that I don't have a more accurate answer, but really, uh, Microsoft will have the answer to that one. Next question is, you mentioned read-only containers. Would you mind explaining how this is a shift so the container itself is immutable? So this is currently work in progress, so there is no, there is no like a Docker run dash dash lockdown flag yet, um, but um, this is not extremely hard to achieve either by trivial patches in the Docker daemon um, or by clever use of Docker exec to uh, remount as read only the root file system of a container. Next question is what are the views and announcement of Docker support for Windows? Well, yeah, same thing as the previous one. Uh, that's more like a question for Microsoft. Um, are all those things equally valid and possible on Windows host? I, I don't know. Um, we will see once this is released, actually. Mm, we've talked about deployment. Shall we use a Capybara or a similar tool to deploy our application, or shall we replace the container itself holding the new code? So I don't know Capybara, but I will assume um, that it is something like uh, Capistrano, maybe. Um, and um, yeah, the idea is that it's possible to use things like that, but our best advice is to um, try to use immutable infrastructure ideas, so try to replace the container with the container with the new version. Um, can I easily have containers on a remote machine during monitoring Elasticsearch, for example, for the containers on different containers on different machines? Um, Kind of. Um, the idea would be to have a local container to gather the information you need and then relaying that information to another container elsewhere you have to gather everything. Uh, and we still have a bunch of questions, but I, we might be running out of time, so we'll try to 
uh, take a few more questions. So, can we create Docker containers on VMs? Yes, that was an easy one. Uh, I have a small boot disk for a Docker host. Is there a way to direct my volumes to different disks? Yes, just as well. You can use boot to Docker or CoreOS and then mount other disks and use them as volumes. Where do you recommend putting SSL certificates? I would put them on a volume and then I would share that volume with another container that would act as a kind of uh, uh, a trapdoor. So uh, I would send the certificates to that other container so that they are shared with the main application. Uh, thoughts on DACE. Um, no specific thoughts. DACE is one of the members of the ecosystem and it's a nice um, option for people willing to deploy platform as a service uh, with Docker. Next question, how much damage can you cause as a root in the container with the shell slash etc? Um, if you share slash etc from the container, then you can, I mean, if you share the host slash etc with the container, then yes, you can do a limited amount of damage. So probably don't do that if you can't trust the container. What's the plan for against the dash dash privileged option? Um, so the dash dash privileged option is what we call an escape hatch. It's like there is that thing I want to do with Docker, but uh, I can't uh, because um, of the security model. So how do we do it anyway? The answer is the dash dash privilege option because it's related to do anything, but at the expense of security, so you have to kind of know what you're doing. Uh, okay, next question. Are there any plans for an official UI to manage Docker clusters based on the proposal that I mentioned regarding cluster management? Um, that's a good question. I I don't know. I don't think we want to have a kind of official UI. We probably want to provide one, but then uh, we certainly want it to be open and pluggable in such ways that it can be extended or replaced if needed. And the last question is, how do containers fit in with Puppet? Can Puppet manage images or should one manage the actual contents? So that would be a rather long question. The short answer is that uh, you can totally use Puppet and the Puppet Master and uh, all that ecosystem to start containers and that's an extremely good way uh, to deal with mid-scale um, fleets of Docker hosts. You also can use Puppet to create Docker images, but it's, it's probably not an optimal thing to do. Uh, we tend to prefer uh, to use um, Docker, I would say normal Docker files to create your Docker images, and even though you can use Puppet for that, it's probably not the best way to do that. Um, I I did a talk at the, um, at a few Puppet camps, uh, so if you're familiar with the Puppet camps, you can go to the um, Puppet Labs website, uh, look for the Puppet camps, and they should have slides and maybe videos of those talks about Docker and Puppet integration, and. Oh, and there were more questions. Ah. <laughs> um, is there a way to deploy multiple Docker containers via one config or one command? Um, I, yeah, I believe the answer would be to use fig, where you can describe a stack uh, using a fig YAML file, and uh, you do fig up, and it brings up a stack of containers. All right, and the last question is, how should one rotate logs with Docker? So you still need some uh, collaboration from the application in the sense that uh, the application should still be aware that it's writing logs somewhere and sometimes those logs have to be related. But the way I would do it is I would make sure that um, the application will reopen the log file once in a while and, and then do the rotation from the log management container. So once in a while the log management container will just like move the log files around and just wait until the application reopens the log file. Um, so yeah. And that's it. Thanks a lot for attending. Um, and if you have more questions or if you uh, have like inquiries about uh, the on-prem Docker Hub or other things, don't hesitate to contact our citizen as well. Thanks once again.